Even from earliest times, humans stood and looked up and saw the light from the stars. So the you know, earliest human civilizations looked up and, and, and saw the heavens. But through all that time, the universe has been sending us a completely different set of signals. It's been sending us vibrations and for the first time we have instruments to pick those up and they bring with them entirely different messages about what's out there. These other messengers are gravitational waves, ripples in the fabric of space-time predicted by Einstein's theory of relativity and spectacularly confirmed by LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. LIGO works by detecting subatomic size changes in laser beam arm lengths in four kilometer long detectors. LIGO's already made several remarkable discoveries which resulted in the Nobel Prize in Physics only two years after its first discovery. But this is only the beginning. Ambitious plans are afoot to build new detectors that could find gravitational waves from far further into the cosmos and all the way back to the Big Bang itself. I was sitting in a little cabin in Maine, which I rent, and by the computer, and I see a funny statement on one of the, on one of the uh, sites. There are logs that are kept by the sites. There's a site, as you know, in Hanford. There's a site in Louisiana. And uh, I was looking at the Louisiana site, because that's where I'd gone. And uh, it said, fix-it day is not going to happen. What is fix-it day? Fix-it day is the day we have one day a week when we shut down everything, both at both sites, and we fixed those things that gone broke over the week. So uh, I said, huh, why would they shut down Fix-It Day? It's always every, you know, it's always on a, uh, on a Tuesday. And then I go to the Hanford log, and I find exactly the same thing there. We're not going to have Fix-It Day. And then I got an email. And the email says, go to this site, take a look what you see there. And I saw this waveform that now is famous. Okay? I look at it. It's much too big. Absolutely never expected that we would see something that big. So I figured it was a false injection. Now, let me explain that to you. Uh, during our prior runs, what we had did to test the entire system, that's both the instrument and the people, what well, we had a secret group that would inject signals into the two detectors simultaneously of some waveform that as could have come from astrophysical sources. And this was to see if the instrument was you know, injected into the apparatus someplace to move the mirror a little bit. And he's got, and, and uh, so I said, yeah, it's obviously a, a, you know, one of these false signals that was put in to test us all. And that's, I said, yeah, and then I, then I began to realize that uh, there was a little early we hadn't yet really constituted the team that would do that. And I wrote a little email to a guy who sent me the email address. He says, isn't this a false injection or a, you know, a trial injection? He says, no, we've established it's not a trial injection. Wow. So, well, what was the next horrible thought many of us had? I wasn't the only one. Maybe we had been hacked. It could have been anywhere. We, in the data analysis system. It could have been in the computer system that stored the data. They, people have been, could have been clever enough to go to the apparatus and put some transmitters and receivers into them that would make believe that they were part of the apparatus and they injected signals right at the app. We could think of so many ways that people could hack us. So we put a special group of people together, a very good man named Matt Evans, one of the faculty at MIT, went to both sites, organized a team to look into the hacking. And that became very complicated. It took almost a month. Slowly but surely, people began to say, look, it's more natural that maybe it's easier to explain this as that it came in from nature. And some of us began to relax, some of us didn't. And the thing that finally did it for me was that we had a, another event there was a really very different and very good event on December 26th of that year. And then all of us who were still doubting said, yep, we ought to write this thing up. For a moment, they outshine the entire universe in light, but in gravitational waves. And that discovery uh, literally shook the world 
uh, because when gravitational waves pass by, they affect the interferometer mirrors um, and they move them. The very first ones we saw were pretty big, 30 solar masses, two 30 solar masses objects go around each other, smash into each other, effectively making a new black hole. That isn't quite equal to some of the masses of the two holes. In fact, it's missing about three solar masses. And those three solar masses are what got radiated away. Most astronomers thought that the black holes that we are going to observe will be at the range of five to 10 times more massive than the sun. But the ones that we observed were more like 30 to 35 times the mass of the sun. Uh, you might think, oh, this is only about five or six times bigger than what was observed. What's the big deal? It's a big deal because the usual f way of forming these by the evolution of stars, it turned out was not, it was not possible to produce these heavy black holes. But the other interesting thing from the population of de detections that we have made so far is that all these black holes seem to be either have no spin at all, they're not spinning, or they have spins in or random directions that they completely cancel out. And that seems to be a, a quite a bit, bit of a puzzle as well. It's not only just the masses, but their spins seem to be somewhat unusual. And understanding the origin of those two will be something that is important for the future. We took data in two observing runs in 2015 and 2016 and 17, and those uh, delivered 11 detections. 10 from black hole mergers and one from neutron star mergers. We began taking data again in our third observing run on April 1st, and today is June 24th, I think, or 25th. <laughs> and we have uh, alerted astronomers about 14 different events, uh, 11 of which are black hole mergers. So that's more than what we had before, <laughs> that was 10 and three events uh, that they have low probability, so they might stay or go away, but one is a neutron star, a binary neutron star merger. Another one, it's half, 50% probably of being a, a neutron star merger. And the other one seems to be a neutron star black hole merger. So that would be a first, but that one actually has also false alarm, a large false alarm probability. So it's very exciting. <laughs> LIGO first went into operation in 2002, but for years detected nothing. When the system was upgraded to become advanced LIGO in 2015, the first discovery was made almost immediately after switching it on. But new upgrades will push the system even further, culminating in LIGO Voyager, which is planned for the late 2020s. Pushing the boundaries further actually takes us back to the lab it takes us back to um, developing novel mirrors, the actual portions of the instrument that a gravitational wave moves when it arrives here on Earth. Currently, in advanced LIGO, those are, are formed from 40 kilogram chunks of ultra pure glass, fused silica, super low absorption with uh, optical coatings applied to the front. We envisage that for the next generations, perhaps, of our instruments, rather than room temperature fused silica, we actually might switch to silicon, um, which we can cool down to cryogenic temperatures to reduce the vibrations of the very atoms and molecules in those mirrors, which sit there as a background noise source. But we might need 100 kilograms, 150 kilograms of silicon material. So that's a challenge. Um, understanding the optical properties of that material because it, it has to act as a mirror substrate in the end. And most importantly, understanding the properties of the materials that we apply to the front, a very thin layer, a few microns thick, to turn these chunks of material into mirrors. Um, that's also very important because um, we believe for the current generation of detectors, it's actually the vibration of the atoms and molecules in that few micron thick mirror coating on the front of the substrates that actually will limit the sensitivity of these large observatories. So actually, like many problems in, in science, many challenges in experimental physics, 
material science um, underlies a lot of our future development. Uh, LIGO will be upgraded. Uh, we will roughly increase the distance up to which we can see by a factor of two. That means that we can observe sources by a factor of eight greater in volume. So we will observe events at the rate of something like 10 times, eight to 10 times more than what we have been doing so far. So it's a truly global endeavor in terms of gravitational waves. In Europe, there's currently the Advanced Virgo project involving France, Italy, the Netherlands, and other countries. Um, in Japan, there's a detector called Kagra that's under construction and commissioning currently. And there are, of course, um, plans, quite firm plans, to have another LIGO-like instrument in India. Having those detectors distributed around the globe is important for the science that we, we want to do. Um, because to know where in the sky a gravitational wave signal is coming from, we effectively time its arrival at the different gravitational wave observatories. And with only one observatory, we thus wouldn't have significant directional information. We didn't know where our signal had come from in the sky. With two, we start to have directional information. But with three, four or five, we're really able to pin down where in the sky our signals are coming from, and that's information we can share with our colleagues who have telescopes who may wish to point and examine that portion of the sky for light other electromagnetic signals. In one of our previous films, we covered one of the most intriguing mysteries of cosmology, the Hubble tension. One way of measuring the expansion rate of the universe is to look at the cosmic microwave background. But another way is to look at distant supernova, which are standard candles as they have a known brightness. These two methods do not agree, and the disparity is getting worse. So does this mean that new physics is needed, or is it just a measuring error? Bernard Schutz recently was awarded the Eddington Prize for showing that gravitational waves from black hole collisions, which act as standard sirens, can become a new way to probe the Hubble parameter and potentially resolve this problem. We don't know if this represents a difficulty in, in one or the other way of measuring things and they're not doing it right, or if there's some unexplained new part of cosmology that we don't understand yet, which creates a difference between these two groups because they're measuring the expansion in quite different ways. If we, with our standard siren measurements, we're measuring also something quite local. We're measuring black hole coalescences or neutron star coalescences in the near neighborhood of our universe. So in principle, if this is some new physics, we should agree with the people who measure the supernovae. If, on the other hand, we agree with the people who measure Hubble constant with the cosmic microwave background, and we disagree with the local supernovae people, that would be very strong evidence that the supernovae people are leaving something out in their measurements of distances, because it's a very complicated thing to measure the distance to a supernova. It's much, much easier for us to measure the distance to our um, standard sirens. We have dreams, expensive dreams, but we have dreams because we know how to build better detectors, what we call third generation detectors. Of course, we want to make them a bit cheaper and more affordable, but we have concepts and we are working on those. And those will be built eventually, I hope in my lifetime, I hope actually in the next decade or so. We know what the noises are in our detectors now. We are fighting it, we can make it a bit better, but even with the same noise, if you make the detectors 10 times longer, then they are 10 times more sensitive. And of course, you can make them even more sensitive if you reduce the noise. So the main trick is making them longer. The concept of Cosmic Explorer is making it 10 times longer, 40 kilometers long. Uh, the concept um, of Einstein Telescope, which is a European concept, is to make them 10 kilometers long, but in a triangular configuration instead of L-shape. That gives you a bit more information. Uh, it doesn't help you to localize the source, but it gives you more information about the polarization. Now, 
because they're bigger, that makes them a bit more complicated too, because you have to use larger mirrors and those are heavier, and so you need to, to work on the suspension system. Uh, you need, because they, they are longer, then they are farther apart, so you need to work not just on horizontal seismic isolation, which is what we do best, but also on vertical seismic isolation, because vertical is different <laughs> on, on the two extremes, because the Earth is curved. So there are uh, lots of things that need to be worked out, but we know how to do that. <laughs> Why do we think that that's the right way to go? Well, for a couple of reasons. We know it'll work. It costs money. That's, there's no doubt doing something like that costs money. But we know it'll work. And, as, and the little of our experiences now say that we will probably not be able to make such a dramatic improvement by 10 with all the little things we can think of that are the fixing things that we can think of because all of them are hard to do. Both of these should improve on the present detectors by more than a factor of 10 in, in their reach, in, in how far away. And if you can imagine, a factor of 10 uh, in radius means a factor of 1,000 in volume. And so they'll be, they'll be able, basically uh, working together, to observe every black hole coalescence that's happening in, in the universe. The incredible reach of third-generation detectors will have huge implications for our understanding of the cosmos. But before they are built, we may have the first ever gravitational wave detector in space, called LISA. For gravitational wave detectors on the ground, we observe across a range of different frequencies. From about you know, 1 to 10 hertz up to a few kilohertz, we can pick up signals in that range. But at low frequencies, there's a noise source that becomes troublesome in ground-based detectors called gravity gradient noise. Um, the way our detectors work, we have a suspended mirror whose position we monitor. At low frequencies, local um, things, people walking around, cars driving past, all exert a straight gravitational pull on our suspended mirror. That, that's not something we can shield against. You can't shield against gravity. So we become sensitive to local gravitational effects here on the Earth, rather than the gravitational signals traveling in um, from across the universe. We can't shield against it, but what we can do is fly instruments in space where there are no people walking past, there are no cars driving past, so that gravitational gradient noise is greatly, greatly reduced, and that, uh, that opens up a whole new set of gravitational wave sources for us to detect. LISA is as old as LIGO, almost. Uh, I mean, you know, everybody thinks it's a new thing. People have been more thinking about LISA at least since 1975. The first guy who really began to think about it hard was a guy named Peter Bender. He was on a committee with me that was trying to see what could the space program do for gravitational physics and cosmology. And we knew right away, as soon as you put something into space, you could have very much longer arms. I mean, in fact, it'd be silly to make something with short arms, because you gain, the signal gains with the arm. Beautiful thing that Peter Bender came up with was he came up with something which was sort of five million kilometers on the side, a triangle. If you do it right, and he came up with an absolutely magnificent orbit, the orbit of that equilateral triangle, if you inclined it to the ecliptic, or inclined it to the plane of the orbit, it would have, if you got it just right, it wouldn't need much rocketry to keep it there. One of the decadal studies, and these things happen every 10 years, I think the decadal study of 2010 gave it very high billing, and, and shortly after that, NASA found out that it was in trouble, and they had to get, James Webb was in the way, and all sorts of hell broke loose, and they gave up on it. Now, they didn't give up on it entirely, and now, slowly but surely, it's coming back, and the Americans will have to make some investment, and they intend to, but the project has become a European project. We proposed back in 1994-95 to put a, to the European Space Agency to put a gravitational wave detector into space. They liked the idea, and they've encouraged us to develop it, and in order to support it, they launched a satellite, uh, which was a very difficult satellite to build, um, to test the new technologies that we knew we have to have in order to detect gravitational waves in space. If you can imagine, it's very difficult to build detectors on the ground. Also, it takes new technology in space. 
And that's, that spacecraft was called Lisa Pathfinder, and it was one of the most successful spacecraft that ESA has ever launched. It was launched in, um, at the end of 2015, and so in 2016 and 17, it made fantastic measurements. It didn't detect any gravitational waves, it wasn't designed to do that. It was designed to show that we could build the, the, the gravitational wave detectors, um, uh, the key technology components that we could do that. And it performed factors of 10 or, or 20 better than um, it was expected to, better than uh, the European Space Agency wanted it to. That cleared the path, and now, now ESA, the European Space Agency, is ready to go and has approved uh, our space gravitational wave detector, which is called LISA. Laser Interferometer Space Antenna, LISA, is uh, an adopted mission by the European Space Agency um, with a planned launch date currently, I think, of 2034. They're hoping somehow to accelerate it and get it launched in 2028. I hope they can do it, but it's getting later and later. Eight years to develop this is something. It's a, you have to, there's a lot of work involved in getting a thing like that together. There are three satellites, two and a half million kilometers away from each other, and it, like in a triangular uh, configuration, and there's a laser going from each satellite to each other satellite, so from each satellite we have two lasers. And it measures, like LIGO does, gravitational waves, measuring the distance between the satellites. Now, the difference is that because it's so much longer, uh, the noise is higher, so the sensitivity to gravitational waves is about the same as, uh, as LIGO will, is now. But because it's so much longer, it's going to be detecting gravitational waves of much, much longer wavelength. And those are produced by bigger systems. So those bigger systems are these massive black holes at the center of galaxies, smaller black holes falling into these black holes. We call those embryos, extreme mass ratio in spirals, and white dwarfs in our galaxy. White dwarfs are these big stars, so they're not very massive. They're actually less than the mass of the sun, but they're very big, so they produce uh, when they merge, they are producing gravitational waves of a long wavelength. So it's like a completely different science than LIGO. It's like comparing a radio telescope and an X-ray telescope. They will see little black holes being eaten by the big black holes. And those are very good sensitive tests for the general theory of relativity because you can do the problem so easily. It's a nice problem that a little thing going into a great big thing, a lot of the complexity of two things being equal, close to equal falls away. So it turns out you can do very sharp tests of general relativity with those. And you will certainly discover all sorts of new things. There's no question. It is not just about black holes and neutron stars, which we know they exist. But there are other things probably in the universe. And this is an opportunity by building the next generation of detectors. We will be able to observe such phenomena what they are, I don't know. If I knew, I would have told you immediately, but I don't know what they are, and that's what the you know, exciting thing about science is. And that region of the spectrum, sort of from minutes to hours, is something you can't do at all from the ground. And so their technique is a very different technique than the one by, used by the people on the ground. They send signals between the satellites, uh, all three of them. They send them between them in pairs, but along the arms, and then look and, and then have them resend them. In other words, a signal comes in from one, uh, that's a laser, that's a one micron laser probably, it's from a mirror, a little telescope. It gets, it gets detected by a detector and that gets amplified, put back into, a, into another laser, which had to drive that laser and gets sent back to, that other, to the satellite where it came from. And then they look at the frequency difference. And that's a way of measuring the change of the spacing between the satellites. It's a, it's a different technique. And it measures, it's the way we're measuring 10 to the minus 18 meters. They don't need to do better than 10 to the minus 12 meters because they're dealing with baselines that are 10 to the six bigger than the ones we have on the ground. Now that is millihertz gravitational waves. There are also uh, now efforts to observe gravitational waves of even lower, something like nanohertz gravitational waves. And they are done by using what are called pulsar timing arrays. 
the basic idea is that you monitor the arrival times of pulses from neutron stars that are distributed around the galaxy and there will be a systematic change in their arrival times in response to a passing gravitational wave near Earth. And so by observing those systematic changes, we should be able to observe nanohertz gravitational waves. So that is called pulsar timing array and that will observe in a different window as well. What would be the source of a nanohertz gravitational wave? Oh, these will also be um, supermassive black holes, uh, but of much heavier nature, uh, billions to uh, tens or hundreds of billions of solar mass black holes that are going around each other. When galaxies uh, come together and merge, the black holes at their centers are likely to merge as well. And those are the sources of these nanohertz gravitational waves. One mystery that future gravitational wave missions hope to solve is how supermassive black holes form. But there are perhaps more fundamental mysteries that LISA and other missions may be able to address. Dark matter, we don't know what it is, but if it is present in, around black holes, for instance, uh, that could be detected because it could drag the orbits of black holes and therefore change the way they are going to in spiral and merge. Moreover, certain kind of axionic matter could extract energy from uh, uh, black holes. If they are, black holes are rotating, there is a phenomenon called super radiance by which this axionic matter can extract the rotational energy of black holes and we might be able to detect them as well. Uh, these are two ways, but some dark matter can actually fall into the course of neutron stars and convert neutron stars into black holes. This will be a fantastic opportunity because if you start to detect something like you know, neutron star sized objects, but they turn out to be black holes. How do we know that they are black holes? Well, we can measure what is called the tidal deformability of these objects. That signature will be present in the gravitational waves that they emit. If this tidal deformability is zero, then they are black holes. And if you have something like neutron star masses, but they are black holes, the only way they could have been produced is because of dark matter accumulation, which converts neutron stars uh, into black holes. Some have suggested that there is no dark matter, and instead we need to modify our theories of gravity to account for the anomalous observations that lead most cosmologists to accept the existence of dark matter. We already actually have um, contributed to the discussion of theories of modified gravity and how that affects um, a consideration of dark matter through our observation of the gravitational wave signals from colliding neutron stars and combining that with um, the observation of, in fact, the gamma ray signals that came from those, that collision. And here on Earth, the gravitational wave signal and the gamma ray, the electromagnetic signal, arrived within 1.7 seconds of one another, picked up here um, around the Earth. And they had traveled 130 million years before arriving with us. So, that tells us that, if you like, the speed of gravity and the speed of light are the same to an accuracy of 1.7 seconds in 130 million years. Now, relativity predicts indeed that um, gravitational waves should travel at the speed of light, and that 1.7 second discrepancy is actually probably real in that um, there's astrophysics involved. It takes time when those neutron stars smash into one another for the the mechanism that produces gamma rays to actually kick in and happen. And with that measurement, the bounds set by that actually rule out a whole class of theories of, of modified gravity, which made predictions that gravitational waves and light should travel at rather different speeds. The dark matter is a mystery, and what we don't even know about it is if it's just one thing. The simplest idea is it's just one kind of elementary particle. But we haven't been able to find that. And it may not be because those elementary particles don't exist. It may be because the dark matter is a mixture of different kinds of things. And so we, we have to go another factor of 10 or something before we begin to see any one of them. And, and that's kind of discouraging. But 
it could be that one of the components of this mixture is um, the, the black holes that we're detecting. Using uh, binary black holes and neutron stars, we can very accurately measure distances to uh, the sources or the host galaxies of these objects. Once you know the distance combined with electromagnetic observation, which could give you redshift, you will be able to map out what is the expansion history of the universe. Now the expansion history of the universe depends on dark energy. And not only dark energy, but also the nature of dark energy, whether it is dynamical, whether it is simply a cosmological constant. So we'll be able to address these questions with the next generation of gravitational wave detectors. If dark energy is related to a deviation of general relativity, and that deviation uh, is, sh is shown in the, signal, in the signals that we see from these massive black holes, then that would give us a clue. Dark energy could be something very simple. It could be just be part of the laws of physics. Uh, uh, Einstein put in his cosmological constant, and that describes the dark energy that we uh, see right now. But we don't have a very good measurement of it. We don't have a very accurate measurement of it. One of the problems is getting uh, uh, a long enough range into the universe to see how the dark energy might be changing. If the dark energy hasn't changed at all out to redshifts of two or three, then maybe it is a simple Einstein cosmological constant. Most physicists would prefer to see the dark energy as something that comes out of quantum theory, quantum electrodynamics, or maybe something from uh, uh, quantum gravity. And that would suggest that there would be some dynamics in the dark energy, that it would change with time a, a little bit at least. With gravitational waves, with the least emission, there's a very big possibility that we can measure the changes in the cosmological constant, which then wouldn't be a constant, um, out at redshifts of, of, of two because we have very, very high precision in measuring the standard sirens. So just like we would measure standard sirens with the ground-based detectors to measure the local Hubble constant, we can use the standard sirens that LISA will observe to go much, much deeper into the cosmology and, and perhaps measure the, the changes in the dark energy. And that would be fantastic. Uh, there are some speculative ideas about how black holes might behave um, with regard to the unification of quantum mechanics and gravity. There is a prediction that the horizons of black holes might have Planck scale substructure, even on the you know, horizon scale, which is kilometers or tens of kilometers or hundreds of kilometers, depending on the size of the black hole. But if these Planck scale substructure exists on horizon of black holes, then we might be able to detect those signatures with future observations of colliding black holes because they will be present in the swan song that is emitted by two black holes that merge together. They don't, they die very smoothly in the sense that the final radiation that comes out is an exponentially damped um, uh, sinusoid. But it is a spectrum of gravitational waves that comes out, and that spectrum has different signatures depending on whether that substructure is present or it is just a classical black hole without any substructure. If you had a theory, what might it predict about gravitational waves, for example? And one of the things is it might predict new kinds of polarizations of gravitational waves. In Einstein's theory, it's very simple. There are two polarizations. It's very like in electromagnetism, there are only two polarizations. But in uh, gravity itself, you could have up to six different kinds of polarizations. And so with enough detectors on Earth, for example, when we have five detectors, we will actually be looking for different polarizations. Another thing we might be able to see is some kind of dispersion. Um, we predict the signals that we get from standard sirens. And the standard sirens we've, we've been observing that, uh, that whose, whose radiation was emitted, whose gravitational waves were emitted something like 
billions of years ago, and we, we are detecting them now. And so they've traveled for over billions of light years. They still have the same signal shape, and that means that higher frequencies and lower frequencies are traveling at the same speed. That doesn't happen in sound, it doesn't happen in any other material that for where we have waves, the, usually there's a different speed of propagation for, for um, high frequencies and low frequencies. And even for electromagnetic waves going through a plasma or something, there's dispersion. If there were dispersion of gravitational waves, it would not be part of Einstein's theory. That would be a hint at something quantum. And it just can be a very tiny thing because we're measuring over such big distances. It doesn't need to very much dispersion to produce um, uh, an observable effect. So there are things like that, dispersion. There are also um, uh, things that uh, have to do with the difference between left and right, uh, left-handed and right-handed. We call these chiral uh, effects in physics. And um, when we get gravitational waves, we typically get gravi a mixture of both cir circular polarization one way and circular polarization the other way. And again, if they fall out of step with one another, then that's a different kind of effect in, in, uh, in gravity. And it would be another indication of a modification of Einstein's theory that could lead us to a quantum gravity. So we're always monitoring these things. Whether we'll find something is just a matter of discovery. So far, Einstein's theory has passed every test. The future of the field took a dramatic turn in 2017 when the merger of neutron stars was detected. In this case, it wasn't just gravitational waves that were observed, but other signals too. And this has heralded a new field of astronomy, combining light and potentially neutrinos and cosmic rays in what has become known as multi-messenger astronomy. So multi-messenger astronomy is looking at the universe in different ways at the same time. The obvious way to look at the universe is with your eyes, and that would detect optical photons. But there are lots of other things that ordinary people can't see, and even special people can't see, like neutrinos, gravitational waves, things like that. But with specialized instruments, we can see those too, and that combining them gives us much more information. What we saw in August of 2017 was the merger of two neutron stars. And that signal came as gravitational waves. Because of the current detectors of gravitational wave, the location of that merger was very large in the sky. So the uncertainty was very large. It's like I tell you, you know, there's been a merger of neutron stars, and you ask me where, and I tell you, well, somewhere around that region in the sky. Uh, Instead, at the same time, we have what we call a gamma ray burst, which is a big flare of gamma rays that was detected with a satellite experiment, and that is very precise. It's like looking at stars in, an, in a telescope. So you have a very precise location, and that allows all the different follow-up experiments to go in that particular direction and follow that for many, many days and study what happened with that merger. Humans have long been fascinated by the idea that there are invisible messengers all around us. And uh, one of those kinds of messengers is real, and it's neutrinos. And these are tiny, tiny subatomic particles that are produced abundantly in stars and other things like supernovae and pass right through us all the time. But very rarely, it's possible to catch one of them in a specialized detector. So AMON is the Astrophysical Multimessenger Observatory Network. And the idea is to combine all this data from all these observatories in one single database. So you could say, well, it's already happening. People are working together. So there are two main features of what we are doing here at Penn State. The first one is that we are concentrating all the signals in the same spot, in the same database. And everybody hears at the same time from everybody else. It's not the one-to-one, -one. so instead of having 10 different observatories and, and you just talk to me and I talk to him and not to you and so on, the communication is centralized in one place. So that's a big change in the paradigm of the multi-messenger communication, you could say. The other big difference, what everybody else is doing, is that we're looking at what we call sub-threshold events. And what does it mean, sub-threshold? It looks a little jargony. Uh, so we are looking for particular signals that are weak enough 
that each individual detector cannot do anything with it. So for example, there are signals that LIGO detects for gravitational waves, but they are too weak for them to tell them apart. So they don't tell anybody else because those signals, they are not so sure that that's a real merger. Instead, they tell us, look, I got a signal, but it's a little weak. We have all the information from all the other observatories, and maybe at the same time, from the same location, we got a weak GRB signal too, that Fermilat, for example, could not tell, yeah, this looks like a big GRB, I'm telling everybody. So by combining these signals, we get a discovery now, because the chances of having a weak signal in gravitational waves, independently a weak gamma ray burst from the same location at exactly the same time, it's from background, it's, it's zero. Multi-messenger astronomy has the potential to answer one of the biggest questions of the field. How do these black hole binaries form? So maybe they were formed since here's sort of the puzzle we now have. Are they, are, are these pairs, are they made when a star collapses? Maybe. Are they made in places where there are lots and lots of stars that are creeping on top of each other? Maybe. Are they probably, are they the result of the collapse of a very, very first stars made in the universe? Possibly. Are they primordial? You have a massive star and it collapses and it makes a neutron star and the, the material bounces and it makes an optical supernova and everybody's happy and you get neutrinos. But what could happen a lot of the time is the whole thing collapses and instead of bouncing, it just keeps going and then the whole star makes a black hole. And then there could be little to no optical emission, but there still is neutrino emission. And so that is something that you can only do with the neutrinos is to find that whole population of collapses that lead to black holes uh, is to capture the neutrinos. Now those black holes, as they form, they could make gravitational waves, but it's not guaranteed. If the explosion, if the collapse is very um, round, spherically symmetric, they don't make gravitational waves. And we know that something is making lots and lots of black holes in the universe, and that's what LIGO is finding. And so one of the ways to find out what's making them is to capture the neutrinos from their production. And the neutrinos that come from the black hole forming case as opposed to the neutron star forming case, the spectrum here is a little bit more energetic. And by capturing a lot of these supernova neutrinos, we could eventually tease out the balance between the neutron star forming supernovae and the black hole forming supernovae. Cosmic microwave background was emitted about three or 400,000 years after the Big Bang. But the cosmic neutrino background was emitted about one second after the Big Bang. So if we ever detected that, it's the deepest look back we've ever had. And it probes the universe at its earliest time and its highest temperature. Cosmic neutrino background is something that uh, every physicist dreams of detecting. And uh, there have been lots of great ideas and all of them have crashed on the rocks. And so far, nobody really has a good idea. We're something like 15 orders of magnitude away from being able to detect that. Uh, there's an experiment uh, based out of Princeton called um, Ptolemy that uh, I think claims to get within several orders of magnitude of detection. I consider that a miracle to go from 15 to only to several because that's a pathfinder towards eventually getting there. And the technique used is to look at um, tritium. Tritium is the third isotope of hydrogen. It's uh, radioactive. And what you can do is you can wait for tritium to decay, and when it decays, it makes a certain electron spectrum and a neutrino that's not seen. But another thing that can happen is a neutrino can come in, a cosmic neutrino can come in and hit the tritium and stimulate the decay, and then the electron comes out with a different spectrum that can be identified as a stimulated decay as opposed to a spontaneous decay. So the spontaneous decay gives, from your perspective, an electron spectrum, this is spectrum versus energy, that looks like this, and the stimulated decay gives an electron spectrum that's a line at the end. And if you saw that line, you would know you've seen the stimulated decay. It's incredibly hard. Um, you asked me earlier if we could conceive of being able to detect this. At the moment, nobody really has a good idea, but we can conceive that people will eventually be able to detect this. We just don't know how. So cosmic rays are, are nuclei going from protons all the way to the heavier particles. Um, of nucleus that we know, so elements that we know. And they are bombarding us constantly, 
all the time. So in these few minutes that we are here, we are bombarded constantly by these subatomic particles. And they cover all kinds of energies, from very low energies that we know they, they could come from the sun, for example. That's what we call low energy. It's a nuclear reactor kind of energy that's very low for us. All the way to the highest energies, which is what we call 10 to the 20 electron volts. So that sounds very weird. But to have an idea, the largest machine that we can build is the Large Hadron Collider, which is in Geneva, in Switzerland. And that produces, accelerates protons to an energy of 10 to the 12 electron volts. These particles, we have no idea where they're coming from. The ultra high energy cosmic rays that we have detected can reach 100 million times higher energy than what we can do in the Large Hadron Collider. If we wanted to build a particle accelerator similar to the Large Hadron Collider with the technology that we have to reach 10 to the 20 electron volts, the ring has to go from here to Saturn and come back. Probably the most interesting, the most important gravitational wave signal we don't know how to measure yet is gravitational waves that were created in the Big Bang and are a kind of a, a very low amplitude hiss that's filling the universe. The trouble with trying to detect that is that every binary system in the universe is also radiating its own gravitational waves and creating a random background. And that background is usually larger than we expect has come from, from the Big Bang. So we have to develop very special space missions to look in exactly the right frequency band where we can expect that the universe itself is kind of quiet and quiet enough for us to, to hear this very low hiss that comes from the Big Bang. And now there's a project called Big Bang Observer. There's another uh, a couple of projects that people have proposed that come, come close to that. Uh, the, the technology is not yet completely mature. There are many proposals for other kinds of detector technologies that may, may function better in space. I think this is going to be a, a long time coming, but I, I would hope maybe in another 10 or 15 years, we'll have a concrete proposal worked out that the space agencies can, can work with and can look at and, and start developing. And, and eventually, we'll get a mission. Because looking at the, the, the gravitational waves from the Big Bang is the most fundamental thing we can do with gravitational waves. Because these gravitational waves were emitted a fraction of a second after the universe formed. We can look back now to the cosmic microwave background in electromagnetic radiation, but that happened to, to that was emitted at something like 300,000 years after the Big Bang. To go right back to the Big Bang and actually get information coming from the, a tiny fraction of a second before, uh, after the Big Bang itself, that would be absolutely astonishing and, and tremendously fundamental. And that's the ultimate goal of this field, but it's still going to be a long time coming. So what is this uh, Big Bang Observer? It's doing all the bells and whistles while it's not on the ground in space. In other words, it, you would now have to take all the sensitivity you have on the ground, that 10 to the minus 18 meters, and in fact, a little better than that, stick it in space, not 10 to the minus 12 meters, 10 to the minus 18 meters. It has to be put in space over large baselines it's me and measure the motions of 10 to the minus 18 meters over 10 to the 6 kilometers, okay? I mean, it's a wild idea. It's way, way far from everything that's being done right now. It's using the technology that we're doing on the ground, applying it to the scales of LISA, okay? And the people who proposed that said, look, you've got to do LISA first. Nobody in his right mind at NASA or in Russian space centers or anybody will let you contemplate this thing until you've tried an interferometer on a scale or a gravitational wave detector that on a scale of 10 to the minus 12 meter sensitivity rather than 10 to the minus 18. Okay? So that's sort of very, very distant future. But suppose that were eventually to happen. It would be, if it's true and we saw something, that would be the most interesting gravitational wave detection ever made. And what, what would we learn? From well, my God, come on, we'd learn how the universe began. They can't ask for more than that.